the safeguarding of faith, life, mind, honor, and property. In the matter of safeguarding of faith, traditional Islamic scholars have normally interpreted that as protection of Islam. But one can find evidence in the Quran that this could be generalized to mean protection of faith, period. As the Quran clearly in Surah 2, verse 256 says, La ikraha fi din, let be no compulsion in religion. And this is not the only verse. The Quran speaks that had it not been that God restrained some people through others, or restrained the tyranny of some people by others who stand to their tyranny, lahuddimat sawami'u wa bi'a. Other than that, if this doesn't happen, mosques, churches, and synagogues would have been destroyed, which means a general protection of practice of faith regardless. Relating to safeguarding of faith is to prevent any abuse by manipulating people psychologically, economically, or politically in order to pressure them to leave their religion or to adopt another. Second objective of Sharia is safeguarding of life. And the Quran is quite clear, and there is not much difference here between the Hebrew scripture or the statements made in the New Testament and the Quran. Actually, the Quran narrates with approval what he ordained previous prophets, especially Israelite prophets. That God ordained that anyone who takes away one single soul without retribution, that's in the case of uh, retribution for a murderer, or corruption on earth, he is like one who killed the entire mankind. And anyone who saves a single life, he is like one who saved the lives of all mankind. But relating to that also, or as a way of implementation of this, we find that Islam established a very strict punishment for premeditated uh, murder, but in the meantime provided for a due process and the concept of shubha that I have no time to elaborate on that could commute the sentence and provided something unique not found in any secular system, the possibility of forgiveness on the part of the family of the deceased. Relating to protection of self also is the right of medication and to being saved in case of danger. Relating to that is the right for food, clothing, and housing to maintain the basic, basic minimum level of existence at least. Thirdly, safeguarding of mind, and this is the reason for prohibition of intoxicants in Islam, and with the beclouding of the mind, we have accidents, we have rapes, and we have all kinds of abuses. But one aspect that uh, typical classical Islamic jurors did not deal with, at least in that topic, they dealt with elsewhere, but I'd like to relate it here, is the positive aspect of uh, preserving or safeguarding the mind, the positive aspect, the duty to learn and search in freedom. In fact, in Islam, learning is not only a right, it is a moral duty. And the first word revealed to Prophet Muhammad, who was an illiterate person, was iqra, recite or read. Fourthly, <clears throat> safeguarding honor. Classical Muslim jurists also dealt with honor largely as sexual morality or protection of the person, of the individual. But again, in my humble <coughs> understanding, there is no problem at all within the Quranic foundation to extend that to refer more to dignity. And if sexual morality and lack of aggression again is the person of the individual, the person himself or herself uh, is used, it is mainly because it is the highest violation of the dignity of the individual, like the case of rape, and that's why we find that brutes use it in war as a means of humiliation. <coughs> okay. Secondly, the uh, equality with other people before the law and before court of law, if there's any exception, we can discuss that later, but it has to be also equitable. If there is no equality in each and every item, it has to be equitable in terms of its totality, and there has to be good reason for that. Again, I have no time to elaborate. Thirdly, freedom of the person, what we call habeas corpus today, that you cannot be arrested without any justification. The right of privacy, which is ingrained in the Quran. Right of movement, which is also in the Quran. Right of expression, and even duty to ordain the good and forbid the evil within decency and maintaining the public peace. The right of good treatment, the Qur'an actually say that you can not even mock 
against somebody else or joke against them, the right of political participation, and finally, safeguarding of property, that property cannot be confiscated, that except for in rare cases like public utility, that uh, theft is forbidden and strictly punished if all circumstances justify the punishment. In conclusion, our duty both as Muslims and Christians, and I fully agree with Dr. Shearer, is to go beyond just statement to try to work together because I see no basic conflict at all in these issues that we can put our hands together and work for the benefit and good of all. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, if for the Christian side, I owe you two minutes. I'll try to make it up for you somehow. Uh, now we come to the 40 minutes part for interactive dialogue, which is going to uh, consist of comments or reactions on the presentations, uh, comparison with the United Nations Bill of Rights, and equality of racial dis discrimination, and so forth. So I would like uh, perhaps our friend in the Christian panel to start discussing pick on points that uh, uh, needs more elaboration from the Muslim side and see things from uh, the Muslim side will happen for the Christian side. <clears throat> I would just uh, interject that two points here. Um, based uh, in part on both the previous presentations, uh, points that emerged from the recent Catholic tradition. On one hand, uh, a major turning point in Catholic human rights theory uh, occurred with the issuance of Vatican II's uh, statement on religious liberty. And in that document, the very basis of human rights was the fundamental dignity of the human person as person. Uh, it was not a question of what they believed uh, and so on. So it was very similar to what, what you uh, were, were trying to present. Um, and I think that's a, uh, that is a strong thrust within uh, present-day uh, Catholic thinking uh, it certainly put an end to one of the obstacles that existed to strong support of human rights in previous Catholic thinking, namely the understanding that uh, ultimately error had no rights and that, uh, in a sense, human rights were dependent on correct belief. Uh, that wasn't always implemented, to be sure, but in theory that, that, was, uh, that was in existence, and uh, Vatican II put an end to that. So on one hand, you have this thrust, which you also seem to lift up, uh, of saying that human rights ought to be rooted in a kind of fundamental belief in, in human dignity, uh, almost apart from particular theological or religious traditions. On the other hand, I think towards the end of your presentation, you, you talked about how much richer, in a way, the religious basis for human rights is in comparison to many secular bases. Well, one of the things that's happened recently uh, in terms of Catholic human rights, certainly under the pontificate of John Paul II, uh, there's been a tendency to move away from that kind of emphasis on the fundamental dignity of each human person as such, or a more natural rights argument, or a natural law argument that was very prevalent with Pope John the 23rd, and to move to a very specific theological argument, where, for, for example, in uh, John Paul II's uh, first papal encyclical, uh, human rights, in a sense, becomes an integral part of belief in Christ, of Christology. In other words, if you really believe the doctrine of Christ, uh, human rights becomes an integral component of that belief, so that the, the anchor for human rights is perhaps the one, if not the most central belief uh, specific belief of the Christian community, namely uh, the Christological tradition. And I see those two, those two uh, trends sort of still uh, kind of rubbing against each other, and, and it's not clear 
whether they can be brought together or and, and it would be interesting to me to hear how, how you might bring them together because you raised both of them also and they seem to be present.